Uh, thanks very much for inviting me, folks. And uh, I look forward to discussing uh, this topic with socialists elsewhere um, uh, in the country and, you know, operating in different parts of society, because I think that, you know, that, that shapes your vantage point on, on this question in particular. And I think that you can't really discuss um, contemporary politics and, and the contemporary challenges of socialists without um, discussing this issue. Uh, what I'm going to avoid, first off, uh, is trying to define, define the term uh, culture war, um, which along with uh, phrases like uh, identity politics and so on, you know, these are notoriously difficult to define words like culture and identity almost being uh, designed to defy uh, definition. They're incredibly expansive concepts and they don't make for particularly stable categories. Um, but the reason I want to avoid that game of categorization is um, there are a lot of people with a vested interest um, in, in, in trying to argue that those are not functioning concepts. I think most people who are involved in politics and, and certainly socialists uh, who are trying to operate politically in this period are well aware that there is a phenomenon, wh whatever uh, word you want to use for it. Indeed, I think if you're a socialist activist, um, then you're sort of haunted by this phenomenon uh, to, to a certain extent. <clears throat> it creates a lot of problems for you. Uh, in your day-to-day -day attempts at political activity, at theorizing, uh, at building organization, uh, and so on. I'm sure that everyone in this call has their own horror stories uh, related uh, to it. Um, but, you know, both sides of, of the culture war often resist this categorization. So you get uh, left-wing culture warriors who argue that what they're doing is not a culture war. It's just traditional left-wing politics. And that uh, a red thread links all kinds of different uh, historical strugg struggles and historical junctures together with what we are doing today. So they will claim for themselves uh, things as diverse as second wave feminism, the civil rights movement, gay liberation, anti-colonial struggles in the third world, maybe going all the way back to the struggles against um, slavery, slavery and for uh, abolition in the United States uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, and claim that this is all one big undifferen undifferentiated package of, uh, of politics and that what they're doing is nothing new, even that they're following uh, Lenin's injunction uh, for socialists to be the tribunes of the oppressed, uh, and that avoiding sort of cultural or social questions is a hurdle that has to be overcome on the left, a question to which I'll return. And then, of course, on the right of the culture war, um, you often get even vaguer claims being made about what's happening here, that um, people like Lawrence Fox are simply defending basic democratic rights and traditions, traditions of Western liberalism. In the UK in particular, where the culture war doesn't have a particularly strong religious or socially conservative inflection, uh, you very often find this claim, I'm simply standing up for the rights of freedom to speech and so on. And these are themselves huge uh, and sort of very watery concepts. Um, and, and the purpose of this is to, to argue, as I say, um, is, is to obf obfuscate the stakes in, in, in this uh, contemporary battle. So I'm going to skip you know, the kind of process of hedging my bets on this or that phrase, call it what you will. Uh, I think we're all very associated uh, with, um, uh, with this sort of politics, with politics being divided uh, in the way it very often is in contemporary times. I mean, in many ways, 2020 has been yet another year in which uh, this reframing of politics seems to have peaked. But I think for, for people in this meeting, many of whom will have a longer perspective on political activism, you've probably encountered this politics repeatedly over the last 10 years. And it, claim, it tends to be spasmodic uh, in its emergencies. There tend to be periods where public discourse, certainly in radical politics, which is very uh, sensitive to these wider impulses, um, you know, where, where politics becomes completely dominated for a period um, by uh, 
the culture war uh, questions. Um, so, assuming that people broadly agree on on what this phenomenon looks like, sounds like, feels like to be involved with it, perhaps we can return to disagreements about that, but assuming a broad acceptance of this phenomenon, uh, I'm more interested in, in art talking about where it's come from um, and what it's, uh, what challenges specific, specifically it presents to socialists. Um, because I think often there is an attempt to, uh, or there's a disinterest in the material basis uh, for this politics, unusually, you know, for people who are attempting a, a materialist analysis of, of social development. Uh, and I'm going to link it to uh, a series of interrelated uh, developments, particularly in the last 30 or 40 years. Again, I don't want to get tied down to where the actual roots of this began, because you can argue about that endlessly. Most people accept that it's a post-war development from the sort of 60s and 70s onwards. But I actually think that the liberation politics of the 60s and 70s are very distinct by this point with what we to what we've been left with. Um, I mean, in fact, I, again, you, you get a lot of left-wing culture warriors in particular, um, imagining that their politics fundamentally relate to attitudes, you know, that might have descended from, say, the Black Panthers. And actually, I think the version of left-wing politics that you now have is extremely distinct from, from, from that kind of militant anti-racism, as an example. Um, so I think that the material, um, the material developments which, which underpin this politics are actually so ubiquitous and so huge that they're usually ignored. The most obvious starting point is the retreat of independent working class politics. This is the fundamental basis for the rise of the so-called culture war. Um, with the retreats across swathes of the world system uh, in the 80s and, and 90s in particular, we've seen a huge dismantling of um, working class institutions, uh, independent uh, creators and producers and disseminators of independent working class ideas and ideologies. I think for um, people of the age group in, in this call, call right now, it's probably difficult for us to recall, or in the ca case of many of us who are younger, imagine uh, the scale of that um, retreat. Um, and that, that has had so many uh, uh, consequences. But the fundamental one is that politics in the present period uh, is very often framed between vying elements of the ruling elite. Um, you only need to look at the two world centres of the culture war um, right now, this evening, to see that that's the case. Boris Johnson is presently locked in dubious battle with uh, Ursula von der Leyen of the European Commission. Um, Joe Biden and Trump are locked in uh, an even more dubious conflict uh, over uh, the succession of the, the president in, in the United States. Um, and in both of these seminal conflicts in the political sphere, the working class is completely locked out. It doesn't have a voice in the situation um, and it doesn't even command significant forces on the streets outside of the negotiation rooms uh, trying to present um, its own case, trying to fight its way in. Um, and even though in recent years there has been a relative uh, resurgence of class politics and, dis and discussion of class uh, in particular since the 2008 financial crisis, we're still talking about a deeply uh, uh, impacted, uh, you know, social system where class has significantly declined as, as part of our political language, as part of political, the, the organized political sphere uh, compared to a period like, say, the, 19, the 1970s. Um, in tandem with that, uh, and I think this is often, you know, it's hard to overlook how important this development has been, there's been a very significant transformation in the civic sphere, in, in the most important civic institutions. So the two most obvious are um, the massive uh, expansion of sort of digital communication, particularly things like social media, uh, which has happened in extremely recent history. I mean, we're probably only in, you know, it's only in the last 15 years that social media, for example, has exerted a, a, a significant influence, particularly over some of the more politicized layers um, of society. 
just as important is the massive expansion in higher and further education. Uh, and that's uh, a development which doesn't just have cultural implications, it has huge economic implications. I mean, the economy of a, a country, uh, the, you know, like the UK, um, the, the expansion of campus culture is huge uh, and often has very significant implications for the local economies of campus towns and so on. I mean, the way in which towns and cities are regenerated, so-called, in, in the UK is almost exclusively done now uh, through campus type development, student housing um, and so on. I mean, that's an indicator of just how important the expansion of higher and particularly uh, further and particularly higher education uh, has been to contemporary culture. We now uh, live in a country where roughly half of young people at least attend university, if not um, graduate. That's a massive uh, cultural shift. And obviously the cultural and political uh, and economic uses of, of higher education have changed significantly uh, in that period. Um, and leading on from, and of course, there's also been a massive decline of other institutions of names on, you know, political parties uh, with mass memberships. I mean, in recent years, we've seen sort of explosive mass, mass membership experiments like Corbynism and the SNP, but to a significant extent, that also reflects the profound weakness of uh, traditional party political culture. Th those parties often flare up and then with, with a sort of paper membership and then shrivel right back down again. The Tory party is in a permanent crisis of, of, uh, of its membership and, uh, and its decline, decline as a mass membership force, a party which once had, I believe, something like two million uh, members or people in associated organisations. It now almost certainly has fewer than 100,000. Um, also the decline of uh, newspaper circulation, also the decline of church life. I mean, in some countries that means more than others, but in Scotland, for example, uh, Church of Scotland membership pe peaked in 1955. You, you know, th there has been a massive shift in the institutional basis of society, particularly of the middle class uh, in, the, in the half century uh, since then. Um, and that, my last point on this is that, that those institutional changes have had an important uh, bearing on the ways in which that new conflict uh, at the top of society between different factions of the ruling elite, relatively unmediated by the working class, then percolates out through the middle class uh, and through the well middling strata, I'm not gonna say the middle class, I don't really think there is one, but middling strata uh, who have relatively high levels of control over the institutional life of, of capitalist society. And that last point, I think, is an important one, because I think people on the left are sometimes, uh, they don't want to engage with that reality, um, because one of the claims of the right in the, in the kind of culture war framing is that all the newspapers and the media and the universities are all controlled uh, by liberals, uh, and that they are persecuted in these institutions. Now, of course, the claims of the right uh, about the extent of that persecution of, of people on the right is uh, grossly exaggerated, uh, often ludicrously so. But it does contain a kernel of truth. There are significant areas of institutional life in a country like the UK today where you are likely to go further if you agree with a certain uh, version of the liberal uh, worldview. And it's become quite common in, in institutional life for people to cartelize um, different elements uh, of that institutional life uh, to factions of people like themselves. I mean, I remember, for example, just to give one example of this, uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission. You know, you, you got people on the left saying, uh, well, I don't trust the HRC to uh, come to a, a clear determination on the question of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party because there's X, Y and Z conservative in there. Well, the reason we all knew that the EHRC report into the Labour Party would be damning isn't because it's full of conservatives, it's because it's full of liberals. Um, but people on the socialist left find it difficult to assert um, that argument, to assert that uh, liberals who, who uh, wield cultural and intellectual and social influence through liberal institutions victimize the left, which of course they do. 
um, because they're not part of a broad church that we are also members of. They're a distinctive social layer with a distinctive project and distinctive material interests linked to, to their own institutions. Uh, and I think, you know, it's the same with The Guardian. I mean, the problem with The Guardian is not that it hires the odd, you know, former spite columnist, as you sometimes hear. The problem with The, with the Guardian is that it's full of liberal cultural war warriors and it's part of their politics to attack the left. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's one area where I think um, the socialist left needs to overcome its sort of hang-ups and its attachments uh, in, the, in, the, in the culture war. Um, and that, that, that institutional power, of course, is not only wielded by uh, liberals. There's a very different picture um, uh, between the UK and the United States, uh, where in the United States, which is the true homeland of the culture war, there is actually a very substantial socially conservative sphere. Uh, if you think about the sheer scale, the number of, number of Bible seminaries there are in the United States, the number of universities run by evangelicals, the network of churches worth billions and billions of dollars on their own, and everything associated with that, you know, radio stations, TV, you know, radio is a big thing in, in the United States, publishing houses and so on, specifically for the religious, cultural, conservative um, right. They wield, conservatives wield very significant uh, social power uh, through those institutions in a way that just doesn't really happen in, in, in the United Kingdom where um, the official, you know, the Anglican church, for example, is a shadow of its former self and in any case is relatively liberal. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't institutions um, in the UK where, that obviously still exert a socially conservative influence, such as the army and the police, for example. And we all know, uh, you know, having seen firing squads uh, shooting at a, a paper Jeremy Corbyn, that that, that uh, is a real thing. These institutions are not, of course, generally uh, uh, socially liberal or, or above politics, um, as it were. Um, but there is a difference between the UK and the US in this regard. I meant to say when I mentioned social media that, um, you know, part of this modern phenomenon is the digitization of the Anglosphere and the carrying of American, the American version of the culture war uh, into, uh, well, all over the globe, but in particular into other parts of the Anglosphere. Uh, I mean, I would, I would argue that the last 10 or 15 years through the influence of social media, the influence of the internet more generally, uh, has seen the most important period of Americanization uh, of Western and particularly Anglosphere culture since the end of the Second World War and the emergence of the uh, US kind of consumerist uh, model. Um, I suspect that people on uh, this in this meeting right now will remember the change. I certainly did. I remember when I started uh, hearing people uh, speaking in sort of with American accents and in American idioms around them about, uh, about activist movements, roughly around the time of the uh, start of the student movement or even the kind of decline of the student movement you would start to hear in, uh, in university occupations and so on. People re-rehearsing the American so-called campus wars in a, in a UK context, often using a conceptual you know, uh, toolbox that had very little to do with uh, actual uh, tensions in, in UK society. Uh, and, and accompanied by um, a sort of cultural idiom which is quite alien to British society where there was a high premium on uh, personal moral purity uh, on um, denouncing people who were seen to, to trans transgress kind of new moral codes that were introduced and so on. I'm sure we all have, again, our, our sort of horror stories of that. But it does indicate the kind of material basis for, uh, for that development, um, that the decline of uh, socialist traditions and socialist organisation uh, didn't just mean that there were no traditions and no organisations, it meant that a generation of activists was trained uh, through social media, and that was the traditional basis for their politics, and they adopted new traditions, most of which had incubated in, in the United States and in the expansion of the university sector um, in, in the United States. Um, now, uh, finally, on, the, on, on, on a few um, consequences of how I think that socialists should address this problem. 
Uh, and I have to say, I think it's not actually the issues that it creates um, are not easily resolved. Briefly, those issues are simply that it's very easy for the left to become deranged and distracted from the material experiences of most people in society. I mean, just in this year, and I don't say this in any mood of accusation because I've not, you know, produced anything worthwhile on this front either. But it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have thought at certain points that we were faced in the middle of uh, this historic recession uh, and that mass unemployment was stalking the land and so on from the sorts of conversations that you hear uh, on the left. I mean, perhaps some people here are involved in rather more useful and constructive activities than I am. But a lot of what you hear from what can broadly be described as the left is not an engagement uh, with, with those sorts of uh, issues. Um, and I think, um, and, and also, frankly, just that, that this culture is often extremely self-destructive uh, and uh, rapidly expends the energies of the left and creates enormous demoralization uh, and disunion uh, on the left. I, I mean, I have to assume that the way in which um, Jeremy Corbyn has effectively been thrown to the wolves by so many on the left has something to do with this, something to do with an acceptance of one of the one of the favourites of the culture war, the McPherson principle, which is that um, only people who suffer oppression have the right to define that oppression, uh, which is an idea completely alien to the radical traditions of uh, something like Marxism, which stresses uh, concepts like contradictory consciousness and false consciousness and so on, and the idea that the experience uh, of things like exploitation and oppression does not lead automatically to uh, a correct understanding of, of, of real social conditions. Um, I mean, even speaking out loud, such a fundamental Marxist concept of that would be heresy uh, on, on the left wing of the culture war. Um, and I think, you know, we, we on the left, I mean, I grew up with a body of socialist literature, which was specifically designed to combat class reductionism, uh, which has also become a kind of uh, a claim on, on the left of the, of the culture war. And for good reason. I mean, if you think, for example, in, in say, socialist organisations in the UK, after the defeat of the miners' strike, uh, a brutal internal battle had to be waged to convince old hands, you know, union militants and so on, that that form of the class struggle had declined uh, and was not about to imminently return. The, the, the struggle, as it were, just within the workplace through trade unions and so on. And that, um, that meant that there had to be some kind of reorientation towards wider issues in society. Amongst them, just as one example, uh, the Thatcher administration's assault on the LGBT community, a very real uh, attack, and it was very right for socialists to fight back against that. Um, so I think that, you know, we're all or should be acquainted with the, uh, with the critique of class reductionism and the need to embrace the entire social ensemble in um, political strategy. Um, but I think if, if uh, you know, th but those are old arguments. Uh, I mean, you've, you very often come across people um, on the left who seem to think that uh, Beyond the Fragments is a cutting edge document. Um, well, actually, the authors of that book have achieved their revolution um, and it doesn't look very good. I mean, <laughs> I mean uh, they, they have created their left, which is decentralized, um, which embraces concepts like the McPherson principle. They have destroyed the, the democratic socialist, the evil Leninist uh, left and so on. And what are they left with? They're left with a, a squalid culture war uh, in which the left just as often cannibalizes its own side uh, as achieves things, where the working class simply majority simply doesn't have a voice. Uh, and it's created a world, of course, of enormous instability. Uh, and it's actually, in many regards, uh, it has rearmed reaction. You know, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, Donald Trump massively increased uh, his vote. Uh, there, there is no sign that the culture war is actually effective at, at damaging uh, dangerous reactionary uh, ideas or that they can't simply reform under the conditions of the culture war uh, to, to renew the assault. Um, so I think, in a sense, we need to get beyond that literature. We need to get beyond those lessons. 
uh, and we need to find a way to reinterpret class politics uh, in this period and class organization and so on that is effective. Um, but what we should be aiming at overall is not to counteract, for example, the struggles against racism, uh, the struggles against the far right, uh, and so on and so forth, right? We're not, we're not seeking to counterpose these things. But I think that we are or should be seeking to aim for what is political and salient um, in any given time and not what is simply fashionable among, among uh, small circles of activists. It's a difficult balance to achieve, um, but I think it's one that needs to be uh, attempted. Um, and I think I'll just leave it there. I'm, I'm very interested to, to hear what people have to say, given their different um, experiences. But that's my, my broad conclusion. There is a need for a continued reorientation, which could be dangerous. We could get things wrong whenever you're trying to reforge politics into a new direction. But I think we have to do that. I don't think we can simply submit to the current course of events because of the dangers that it, it poses.